Hello and welcome to the Real-Time and Big Data GIS Best Practices Technical Session. My name is Josh Joyner. I'm Product Manager for the ArcGIS GeoEvent Server. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Suzanne Foss, who's the Product Manager for the new ArcGIS Analytics for IoT. The primary focus of today's session will be regarding the ArcGIS GeoEvent Server, uh, which brings real-time GIS capabilities to the ArcGIS Enterprise Platform. Uh, this is an intermediate to advanced session. Uh, we won't be covering a lot of the general usage and functionality of GeoEvent Server, but rather recommendations on how to more efficiently leverage some of these capabilities. Um, I would highly recommend our real-time analytics session if you're just getting started, uh, or one of our intro sessions. I think it'll be really beneficial for you. Uh, so let's take a quick look at our agenda for today's session. Uh, we're going to start with reviewing some architecture recommendations for both the GeoVent server and the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store. We'll discuss some potential deployment uh, patterns and configurations. Suzanne will talk through some of the different considerations regarding service design. We'll then explore some of the new tools available to users in the current 10.8 release. And finally wrap up with, with some of the resources that you can leverage after today's session. So we'll kick things off with um, some architecture recommendations. Um, I really can't stress enough how important it is to leverage the right resources for these products, especially if you're trying to support larger volumes or velocities of data. Uh, we do the majority of our testing against cloud-based resources, which is really the next best thing to running on bare metal. Uh, for Amazon AWS, a good starting point is the uh, M5 uh, 2x large instances or the kind of DS4 V2 on Azure. Uh, that being said, you can run this on a virtual machine. Um, however, we've consistently found it required additional resources uh, allocated to a traditional VM uh, to kind of provide comparable performance. Um, in terms of some of the um, things like network, uh, faster is better. I mean, that's really all there is to it. Um, if your expected workloads need to support high velocity throughput, um, I'd always recommend whatever system uh, supports the higher network and bus speeds, um, at least one gigabit uh, per second. Uh, memory, eight gigabytes is required. Um, I'd suggest at least 32 gigs. Uh, however, it's important to modify the GeoVent server configuration um, because as by default, it's only leveraging four gigs. So if you're doing a lot of work with geofences or stored geometry, kind of stateful processing, uh, you're going to want that additional memory available. Uh, processors, like, net, like the network, uh, faster, uh, in this case, more cores is better. Uh, higher data volumes and more complex analytics uh, really tax the CPUs. Uh, so we recommend at least... Uh, eight virtual CPUs, um, but again, you know, scaling as needed. Um, also recommend, um, as I mentioned about virtual machines, depending on the operating system and the environment, uh, you might need to provide a larger number of processors to kind of offset um, if you're using kind of virtual machines. Um, finally, in terms of, of disk, uh, while the, the product footprint itself isn't very large, uh, at 10.6 and newer releases, we are leveraging file-based message queuing for improved stability, uh, but that comes at the cost of additional disk space needs. So the more inputs and outputs you've created, the more disk space um, you'll need. Uh, also, uh, as with some of the above components, faster is better, solid state drives, uh, reduce write speeds, uh, which in turn supports kind of better performance across the board. Uh, you'll find almost the same recommendations for the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store. Uh, however, you'll have uh, kind of much larger um, disk needs based on the volume of data being stored. Uh, this should be a separate machine, uh, which we will talk about more in an instant, uh, in a minute. Uh, but, you know, kind of given your workloads and data and storage needs, uh, you might actually opt uh, for even more resources on this machine, uh, which will help support, um, you know, faster uh, read and writes from across the platform. One thing to be aware of also is that the Spatial Temporal Big Data Store is a part of the ArcGIS Enterprise platform and not priced by core, uh, so it's already included. Uh, so I'd certainly push for the best hardware available. Um, and the majority of the feedback we've gotten from users is that they're most successful when this is actually the beefiest machine in their full stack. Uh, that being said, there are uh, other considerations uh, beyond uh, simply how many resources you can allocate uh, to a solution. Uh, so for that, we're going to take a little deeper uh, look at some different deployment patterns and, and best practices. 
Uh, so I, again, I can't stress this enough, but uh, GeoVent server and the spatial temporal big data store need to be on separate machines from the rest of the uh, ArcGIS enterprise. Uh, it should not be on the same box as the hosting server uh, because GeoVent server requires a local installation of ArcGIS server. Sometimes it can be very tempting to leverage that server for other tasks too, um, but it's really limited for use uh, by the GeoVent server. Um, and uh, we've actually have uh, dedicated licenses at 10.5 and newer releases that only enable key parts of that local server installation to, to really kind of limit that usage to what we need on the GeoVent server side. Um, if you need to scale out your deployment to support greater throughput or data storage requirements, you can deploy multiple GeoVent server instances uh, or join additional uh, data store nodes uh, for improved uh, data resiliency. Um, but let's kind of hold here uh, just a minute um, to discuss uh, some multi-machine deployments. I know this is a topic that comes up and, and has come up many times over the years. Uh, there are two approaches to support this, um, which we'll refer to as the site versus silo um, approaches. Um, with the site approach, uh, you would configure multiple GeoVent servers to use a shared ArcGIS server site. Basically, when you're kind of setting up that underlying server, you'd pick to join an existing site instead of creating new. Uh, this is in comparison to the silo approach where each GeoVent server instance is running in isolation as a part of their own ArcGIS server site. The site-based approach is not recommended. I mean, let me say that one more time. The site-based approach is not recommended. Um, it really requires significant effort uh, to maintain synchronization um, across all participating machines. And while it does provide better performance, it's not really providing a full HA or, or DR support. Um, in cases where a server goes down, maybe due to a power outage, some critical failure, or other kind of longer-term problem, it works really well. Uh, it, it's able to adjust the load across the different machines. But in an environment with frequent restarts or less stable networks, uh, it can become a huge investment, making sure all the machines are properly talking to each other. And for that reason, I'd only recommend it in a very uh, few kind of select use cases. Uh, instead, kind of I'd, I'd recommend looking at the silo-based approach. Um, however, leveraging that deployment will require third-party infrastructure, such as a load balancer or Kafka, uh, to distribute messages across all participating machines. Uh, we will come back to this topic again in a few minutes, um, but for now I want to uh, discuss some other recommendations uh, regarding your deployments. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, GeoVent server will require additional disk space based on the number of inputs and outputs you've created. And I want to be very clear here. Uh, I said created, not running. Uh, we use file-based message queuing, which can provide much better storage retention, message retention. Uh, but stopping an input or output doesn't mean that those needed files kind of supporting that connector go away. Uh, so for those users, uh, you know, running 100 plus uh, connectors in the environment, you really want to pay attention to this. When you install ArcGIS Server on a machine, you get to decide where the binary files are laid down. Maybe you chose the default settings for Windows would be the C program files ArcGIS, or maybe you opted to install the product to a different disk drive or volume. When you install GeoVent Server, our content gets laid down on top of those folders. However, the GeoVent gateway, basically that's our config store and message queues, those get installed to either of the two paths you see here um, at the top. This is either going to the program data folder for Windows, or in the case of Linux, it's going to go under the main user account um, in your home directory. Now, this is regardless of where you chose to install the binaries. So, you know, again, come back, if it's a Windows installation and you chose to install this on an E drive, those files are still getting laid down to the C drive. Um, and the reason this is important is if your machine is configured with kind of really small primary volumes, maybe because you're, they're only just allocating enough space for the operating system, you could stand the risk of accumulating a lot more space on that volume without ever knowing it. Um, and to change this, it's, it is pretty simple. You do need to stop the Windows service or Linux daemon, uh, edit the two following files here, um, update the path to where the folder you want, restart, and it creates the new kind of necessary structure for you. Um, it is important to note that when you do change these paths, your existing configuration does not get copied over. 
it's effectively a fresh installation. Uh, so you'll have to um, basically, it, it's best to do this maybe in a, in a kind of new uh, installation, or um, what you can also do is, is change it and then just import your existing config and you're kind of back exactly the way you were before. Um, some other things to consider, GeoVent server and the gateway services uh, should be left running. Uh, they shouldn't undergo frequent restarts. Uh, I know that right might run kind of contrary to some IT philosophies that promote uh, machine restarts every night or every Friday night. Um, but keep in mind, GeoVent server is typically uh, configured to continuously ingest new data and uh, probably write that data back out somewhere after performing analysis. And, and just like hopefully someone doesn't come along and unplug the, your computer while you're in the middle of kind of typing out a report or email, um, but instead gives you an opportunity to save your work first, uh, we would hope and, and, and kind of what we would expect and want you to do is to go in and kind of make sure all of your inputs and outputs are stopped before any scheduled restarts. Uh, this can also have impacts on any kind of dependent services. So maybe you don't st restart GeoVent server, but you've restarted Portal or the hosting server. Well, now all of a sudden, the data sources that we were working, against, uh, working with have now disappeared. So kind of long story short, um, if you absolutely do have to do scheduled restarts, um, you know, just make sure that you, you kind of stop everything leveraging those services first. Um, also, uh, kind of a, a final kind of deployment consideration. Uh, if you're doing any patches or upgrades, uh, just make sure to clear your browser cache after installation. Um, I can't tell you how many times users have come back uh, to the product team after upgrading to a new release um, and report problems with the GeoVent Manager UI. Or uh, and, and these are you know more often than not just resolved as soon as the cache is is cleared. Uh, so before we leave the deployment section, I want to kind of come back to the multi-machine deployments uh, we spoke about a minute ago because um, we were just kind of explaining how silo approach is better. Uh, but even that could still require significant effort to deploy correctly. Uh, so we're frequently asked, is there a better option uh, that can provide the improved scalability uh, and data uh, disaster recovery, uh, you know, kind of hopefully out of the box without the need for any third-party integration? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, we do have a new product, ArcGIS Analytics for IoT, um, that was designed to provide just that. And to talk more about that, I'm going to hand things over to Suzanne Foss, the product manager for this new offering. Uh, Suzanne? Thanks, Josh. ArcGIS Analytics for IoT is a new real-time and big data capability for Esri's Geospatial Cloud. It enables easy automated data ingestion and analysis of observation data from IoT sensors. It's a hosted managed SaaS built on a container-driven architecture that uses technology that can scale running jobs across multiple executors, and is also resilient such that these jobs fire back up again if they encounter issues. For a detailed overview of Analytics for IoT, we recommend checking out the introduction session video. For this session, I'd like to go through some of the most common questions we get about Esri's different real-time and big data products. The first question is simply tends to be when will Analytics for IoT be available to customers? And the answer is now. We released it in early February, and it's available for purchase as an annual subscription. The second question is about the relationship between GeoEvent Server and Analytics for IoT. GeoEvent and Analytics for IoT are both built by the real-time GIS team here at Esri, and at a high level, they're for different paradigms of ArcGIS technology. GeoEvent Server is a server role within ArcGIS Enterprise, while Analytics for IoT is a capability or extension for ArcGIS Online. On a similar note, is Analytics for IoT a replacement for GeoEvent Server? Absolutely not. The two share a great deal of real-time functionality, but not actually all of it, and they target different users in scope. So for example, GeoEvent Server is typically leveraged by GIS professionals or administrators, and Analytics for IoT is aimed more at analysts, data scientists, and end users. GeoEvent Server remains in active development, and we're going to be showcasing some of the new features later on in this session. So then if Analytics for IoT is not a replacement, the next thing that we're often asked is why one product over the other? So for that, we'll do a quick side-by-side -side breakdown. The first aspect that might help you choose one over the other is the technology delivery paradigm. GeoEvent Server is server-based software, and as we said, it's part of ArcGIS Enterprise. Analytics for IoT is a SaaS, so if you don't want to roll your own environment or pay IT staff to implement your real-time or big data architecture, then this would be more well-suited for you. The technology paradigm drives some other key considerations too. So if you have IT staff that are savvy and prefer to have full control over your systems, 
or if your technology needs to be on premises, then GeoVent is a better solution. It's also extensible and has an SDK if you need to customize it. Analytics for IoT enables you to avoid any need for IT or advanced GIS staff, but that comes along with being in the public cloud as a SaaS. Analytics for IoT, again, is also built on scalable and resilient technology under the hood. So that rounds out our discussion of deployment considerations. And for the remainder of this session, we're going to focus on best practices really at the user level, beginning with guidance and considerations for real-time service design. And by that, I mean how do you configure your real-time analysis to be as performant as possible and avoid configurations that can cause problems. The first best practice is around your analytic services complexity. So we often ask users how many processing paths they see on this particular slide. And the answer is often one, because there's a single input here, the receive JSON, and a single output where we're adding a feature. But unfortunately, there's not a single processing path on this. Every branch of the model introduces a new path which has processing overhead costs. So for example, we actually have two different paths highlighted here, uh, one in the light, light blue, and one in the medium blue. And these kind of showcase how there's a single path, you know, that might pass through the field calculator through filter D, but it's actually two different paths after this second field calculator, one that goes through filter G and one goes through, one that goes through filter H. And then this is another set of processing paths, where instead um, the paths go through filter E instead of filter D, but then again, there's two different paths here, again, for filter G and filter H. And a third uh, set of paths that go through filter F, and again, it's, it's more than one, even just going through filter F. The key here is that exactly the same amount of data is tested against filter D, filter E, and filter F here. So let's say if you had 1,000 events per second coming into this analytic, and that 750 made it past the first set of filters to the second field calculator. That remaining 750 would each be tested against filter D, filter E, and filter F. So in, any, in other words, the analytic is attempting to handle 2,250 events per second instead of the 1,000 that came in. A GeoVent server is a very advanced tool. It allows you to bring in multiple inbound schemas on a single input, and if you do that, then that can increase the potential for something in the model to behave unexpectedly. Overall, the best practice is to keep your real-time services as simple as possible. So this is another way to look at that. One way is to pre-filter the data coming into GeoVent server. So in this case, service A has a single input um, which we'll say is a mix of three different inbound data streams, and then they're being filtered out by these different filters, as they were in the last example. Service B has three inputs, which are each receiving a unique data stream. And you might think the same velocity is going through both services. But actually, service A is taking that input data and sending all of it to each filter, essentially three times the velocity of what you would think you would have. And in example B here, when the inputs are pre-filtered to only bring in the data from the desired schema. Each of these has, we'll say, one-third of the overall input data and is handled in individual pipelines, which is more performant. Another important thing to keep in mind is that not all processing tools are equal. They do very different things, and some tools are much more expensive than others in terms of latency, which is extremely critical in a real-time process. These three examples all have different number of tools but fewer numbers of tools doesn't necessarily mean better performance. This is actually the order of the analytics in terms of performance from best to worst. Example B has the most tools, but these are all relatively simple. Field Enricher is a simple attribute join. Field Calculator just deals with attribute values. And Intersector is a spatial operation which is more advanced, but it operates against in-memory geofences, which allows for better performance. Example C modifies the incoming event geometry in two ways, which can introduce latency dep depending on the complexity of the data's geometry. So it's always important to remember that with geospatial data, one message can be vastly different than the previous one. Think, for example, of the difference between our simple line feature with two points versus a coastline feature with thousands of points. Lastly, example A, while it has only one tool, is actually the most costly because the service area calculator is an advanced tool that uses network analysts to return a drive time polygon. 
This is an external process that requires a road network for computation, and it typically doesn't run instantaneously. And again, latency is a big issue for real-time analytics and can impact throughput. So the point here is that every component should be considered on its own regarding the impact on performance for the desired use case. Beyond service complexity and tool differences, here's some additional considerations when putting together real-time analyses processes. Many of these apply to analytics for IoT as well. So whenever possible, you want to configure filters and field mappers, which are schema adjustments, as early in the pipeline as you can. If you can reduce the velocity of data being passed early on without multiple filters against the same path, that's ideal. It's also ideal to, to use the field mapper to drop any fields you don't need to reduce the size of the data. Also try to keep the analytic pipelines to a single one and avoid branching and putting separate pipelines back together again, like we saw in the first example. Sometimes this is unavoidable, but especially in GeoEvent Server, it's preferable to separate things into multiple analytic services rather than having a single complex workflow in one service. Lastly, and this is also particular to GeoEvent, avoid managed GeoEvent definitions. Some processors will generate their own definitions, and if the processor is changed or removed, then those definitions can be lost. So when designing your analysis service, after an initial run-through of some data, you can go to the GeoEvent definitions, make a copy of any auto-generated definitions, and then adjust your service to refer to the definitions that you created. That allows other processors downstream to keep receiving data in the expected definition or schema. Next, we're going to spend a few minutes showcasing some of the new tools available for your GeoEvent service. And for that, I'll hand it back over to Josh. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is leveraging new tools. So that's always uh, kind of a fun topic because, you know, it's great that you know to kind of use some of the best practices. We've helped you kind of set up the environment, uh, making sure that you're, you know, um, you know, designing your services correctly. Um, but the other thing we want to make sure is that, you know, you're making use of, of all of the tools that are that are available to you. Um, so what we want to talk about specifically is some of the new stuff that we're bringing out in um, the 10.8 release. Uh, in particular, there's a new embedded utility um, within the GeoVent service designer. That's the primary interface for where you're building out your, your real-time analytic so what we brought in at, at 10.8 is this new component called a GeoEvent Sampler, which lets you take bring in a kind of subset of some of your processed events, and you can actually see what the data looks like um, in real time. Uh, you can see this as prettified JSON. Um, you can see this as delimited text. Uh, you can actually visualize uh, the geometry. So we have kind of a built-in mapping client, so you can actually see um, – you know, is this is this uh, coming through as a point? Uh, I'm sending it to a processor. Uh, is it now coming out as a um, you know buffer? I'm seeing it as a polygon. Yes, I am. It's great. You can know that you've properly configured your tools. Um, you can also compare uh, these different routes. So you could uh, have a filter that's looking for uh, you know vehicles of type truck. Well, you could say, okay, I want to look at the data coming in and the data coming out, and I want to confirm is this filter working as expected? Is it properly filtering the data? So I can see that before and after. Um, so, uh, you know, what we're recommending is folks are using this for, you know, both kind of verifying your attributes because they want to confirm that the data is coming through as expected. Uh, they can use it to, uh, you know, check your schema, uh, make sure that you get the right data in the right fields. Um, you know, maybe you want to modify from one definition to another. Um, you want to remove some fields. It's so much easier to be able to kind of see what the data is looking like uh, to be able to help um, make better decisions in that space. Um, and then also to kind of verify that your geometry is correct. You know, uh, there's nothing worse than building out some tool and expecting a certain alert at the end to find out that uh, all of your observations are off the coast of Africa because you had the wrong coordinate system or you had, um, you know, you were expecting this to be WGIS 84 and uh, it turns out it was, you know, supposed to be in Web Mercator. And so, of course, the numbers are never going to add up for you. Um, so we're going to do a demo kind of that, take a look at. The other thing I want to kind of tell you a little bit about too is um, we are going to add some more to these tools uh, coming at 10.8. Uh, so I know we have a lot of users that uh, choose to, to leverage our long-term supported releases. They wait until they do the dot release. Uh, for those that do wait uh, on playing with some of this new technology, uh, we're also going to add some additional base map controls um, uh, to that event viewer. So I'll kind of show you a little bit of that as well. 
So let's jump right into a demo, uh, let you guys see a little bit about what these new tools look like. Uh, so what you see here is um, the service designer at 10.8. Um, a little pretty similar to what you've seen, hopefully, at the 10.7 release uh, with some new functionality over here on the uh, service tray to the left. So two of the first things you'll notice is we now have um, inputs and outputs listed as new elements. Um, so, you know, we have a service here, uh, you know, with, you know, some input. Uh, we want to create a new output. Well, previously we had to exit to create a new output. Now you can actually drag it over, uh, select the input you want, the output you want, and create it right in the service designer. Uh, you can also start and stop your uh, inputs and outputs directly within the service designer. So in this case, I can quickly see I had an input that was running. I can right click, choose to stop it, and it'll stop. I can quickly see. I can also see um, if any of the input or output connectors are in an error state. So I have an output here. I try to start it. It goes into an error because in this case I have a port uh, that's not open. So I have some kind of TCP output um, you know, issue I need to address. Um, you can also, um, in addition to that, you can uh, create new copies uh, or start and stop the inputs and outputs directly from the service tray as well. Uh, so if you're already using an input or an output in a service and want to leverage it again, you can do that. The other cool thing we've added is the ability to um, modify a lot of your site settings. So I can go in and change your GeoEvent definitions uh, directly within the service designer, no longer having to leave uh, this building experience to go uh, modify your inputs and outputs. You can now modify your definitions, um, your geofences. So I can come in here and configure uh, my geofence sync rules. I can also create new data store connections, uh, or you can modify uh, spatial temporal big data stores. But the thing I wanted to tell you about, when I was talking about this new sampler, um, it's a new collapsible panel. Um, that's on the bottom of the screen here. Um, you can right click on any route, that's any of the pipelines between the nodes, and you can actually see what the data looks like as it's flowing through when the service is running. Uh, so you can uh, see that as either JSON, a prettified JSON, you can see it as delimited text. Um, you can choose to reset it here as delimited text, and now you see we get 10 sample size, 10 sample messages. Um, you can do that as a, a single message, 10 or 100. And as soon as it's received those messages, it's disconnected. So you have uh, no performance impact. Once enabled, you can click on any route within the service, and it'll kind of dynamically switch to sampling what's coming through that route as long as there's new data flowing through. So I could compare if I wanted to go back and forth and say, well, what's my data look like on the output, um, the kind of last step versus the first step? You can do that. Or you can right click on a second route and click compare. This will give us a split view where we can see exactly what the data looks like in one route versus a second. Now we did it here where we had our first and last, but you could do this anywhere in the service to compare what the different um, messages are looking like at that stage. Um, so I can see here I had some points coming in and I had some polygon data coming out. I can see I have, see a kind of ring type data. Um, I can also select, let me do a, a larger data set now. I'll, I'll choose to bring in uh, 100 messages, 100 samples uh, coming through. And notice this takes a little bit longer to fill up. Um, but now once everything is in here, I can also choose to copy these to clipboard. Maybe I want to use it in another uh, product. I can do that. Um, I can also come in here, and this is a really exciting thing. This is an event viewer. So what we're able to do, we have a lightweight mapping client built into uh, the new service designer. I can see I have some uh, point geometry here on the left, which are kind of larger points. But what I have on the right is the actual geometry of those individual observations. So I can click here. Uh, I can have a little pop-up. Um, we have a scale bar. I can kind of see, you know, how large something is expected to be. So instead of just having a kind of generic, um, you know, representation of where these things are, you can actually come in here, see the real data, see what it looks like. Uh, so if I want to see, hey, you know, is, is this thing a, a approaching a coastline I'm concerned about? Um, you know, am, am I uh, expecting that I'm going to be getting polygons here um, because I'm going to be doing some sort of spatial interaction? You know, being able to have that control to be able to see that here within the client, um, and we really hope that this is going to help users uh, make better decisions, uh, be able to make 
um, you know, easier usage of the tools. Um, and really, we're just excited to see what you guys can do with it. So, you know, hopefully some some new fun stuff for you guys to, to play with here uh, coming up. Um, well, actually, we're already out now with the 10.8 release. So hopefully you guys can get a chance to, to go try that soon. Uh, so I want to wrap up with some uh, some additional resources uh, to leave you guys with for those of you that are interested in kind of uh, learning a little bit more about either GeoEvent Server or Analytics for IoT. Uh, we have two different uh, links here, a couple different links I'd go to check out. Um, uh, we have, um, particularly on the GeoEvent Server side, uh, we have a lot of new documentation that was released uh, earlier this year. Uh, we now have... Um, uh, full detailed uh, usage notes for all of our processors, all of our inputs and outputs. Uh, we have some new usage guides out there, um, uh, a couple tutorial links. Uh, this will kind of get you started. Uh, and also on the new product, uh, ArcGIS Analytics for IoT, which Suzanne kind of spoke about. Um, uh, here's the link to the main the main page for that. Uh, there's also some some nice uh, lessons in there to help you get started on that as well. Um, and we also do have recordings of some of our previous technical sessions. Uh, so um, you know it's it's really nice a great idea to go back and and take a look at those if you um, want to kind of see some of how these products have evolved or you want to get a little more detailed uh, introduction into the product. Maybe you didn't get a chance to see that or you wanted to learn a little bit more about analytics. Um, you can certainly go uh, take a look at some of our other real time. Um, videos and recordings. Um, if there are any questions uh, or comments, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to either myself or Suzanne. Um, I can't guarantee we'll be able to answer everything ourselves, but we'll certainly be able to kind of direct you to the right folks. Um, and uh, with that, just want to thank you so much for uh, uh, for being a part of this and, and, and um, uh, participating and uh, hope to hear from you. Thanks a lot. Bye.